I'm back at it with our read-alouds of Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool, and right now I'm going to read the very short chapter 8. I must have fallen asleep into a deep sleep because I woke up hours later to the first light of dawn on a foggy Saturday morning. My body still ached from my first rowing experience, but I felt the need to get up and move. Without really knowing where I would go or what I would do, I put on my sweats and headed out into the mist, first walking, then running. The air was damp and I felt beads of moisture on my face and neck. The world around me was gray and quiet. I settled into a rhythm of my running and let my thoughts run as well. Steeplechase. It reminded me of the landmarks back home. The church steeple, windmill, silo, grain elevator. All could be seen from miles away. I knew where I was when I was there, but the very name of it captured my imagination. Steeplechase. It seemed a quest of sorts, like the quest for the Holy Grail. The runner searching from steeple to steeple, overcoming obstacles along the way. And the fish. To hear those boys talk about him, he must have been like Sir Galahad himself. Courageous, adventurous, honorable. And he'd completed the steeplechase faster than any boy ever had. No wonder he had become such a legend at Morton Hill. I found myself running faster and faster, downhill, uphill, hurtling rocks and jumping fences, creating my own steeplechase as I went. My lungs were bursting and my heart was pounding. Was I trying to beat the legendary fish? We probably weren't even running the same course. Was I chasing after him? What made him run so fast? The way I figured it, anybody runs that fast, they're either chasing after something or running away from it. Which was it for the fish? Which was it for me? Then I saw the log. I could understand why they called it Dinosaur Log. It looked like a long-necked brontosaurus stretched out over that waterfall and the rocks below. Sam had let slip that it was part of the steeplechase. I stopped, my breath coming out in puffs of air as if from a dragon. A dragon being stared down by a brontosaurus. I took the challenge and stepped onto the log. It was slippery with mist and moss, about 20 feet across. I figured it should only take about as many steps, but the sound of rushing water crashing against the rocks below and the thought of Philip Atwater's nearly broken neck made me pause. Still, the challenge lay before me and had to be met. I inched my way out beyond where I could easily turn back. A few more steps, then I was halfway. That was when a double whammy happened. It started raining and I looked down. The rain was falling at a slant, pelting me from the side, forcing me to shift my weight just to stand upright. I'd been in some stiff Kansas winds, but not while standing on a slippery log over a waterfall. My thick sweats hung heavy and clung to my skin. There were only three ways to go, forward, backward, or straight down. The rocks below, jagged and sharp, sent a shiver up my back. I was halfway, I reasoned. Even if I turned back, that would be the equivalent of the full length of the whole log. But I wouldn't have crossed it. What's that, the whole, wasn't that the whole point? To cross, to get to the other side? But for what? There was nothing different over there, just the same rain, the same grass, and what other obstacles would I encounter? I don't know if it was fear of falling or fear of getting across that turned me back, but I maneuvered myself around and inched my way off the log. My arms and legs shook with cold and fatigue. I shoved my hands in the wet front pocket of my sweatshirt and listened to my shoes make squishing sounds as I walked back to school. Mom used to say, get out of the rain before it washes all the dry off. By the time I got back to campus, every bit of dry had been washed clean away. 
I knew the dorm would be full of rowdy boys just waking up to their Saturday, so I veered in the other direction, hoping to find an open door to the school where I knew I had a change of clothes in my locker. The hot shower water felt good on my cold skin and aching muscles. I let it warm me for several minutes before putting on a fresh pair of denims, a long sleeve shirt, and dry socks. Unfortunately, I didn't have different shoes to put on, so I walked down the hall to the library in my stocking feet. I stared at the picture of him in his Morton Hill Academy sweatshirt, his hair slicked back, smiling that smile. I remembered feeling sorry for number 67, the fish, the last time I'd been here. I'd felt pity for him because of all that he had yet to learn about life's cruelties, but something had changed. He was dead. There was no plaque memorializing him, no date to say when he was killed in action. But then, this trophy case wasn't meant for that. It was meant only to lock its inhabitants in a particular time and place, to make its onlookers share forever in their glory days. The fish. Did his exuberant face seem not so exuberant anymore? Where I had once felt pity, I now felt kinship. If the nook was a shrine of the school, the trophy case had become a sort of shrine for me, a place to pay homage to the fish, my patron saint. I remembered touching his boat and sending up a wish, a prayer of sorts. But, I reminded myself, the only answer I'd gotten was that early kid lecturing me about how horrible a rower I was. So much for wishes and prayers, I thought. I padded out of the library so quietly that even if somebody had been there, they'd never have known I was gone. I'll be back soon with chapter nine.